Our next speaker is one of the true leaders of a new generation of designers where scale does not factor into what is possible. He is just as comfortable looking at a problem of light switches and sockets as he is with large scale galleries and boutiques. The last time I introduced him, I made some sort of reference to him starting to live up to the hype. Well, the hype continues to grow and so does his response. He has received a slew of awards, including he received the Ron Tom Award for Early Design Achievement from the Canada Council. He is definitely somebody to be reckoned with. Please welcome Omer Bell. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Omer Arbel, and uh, I thought I'd use this opportunity to talk to you about form. Uh, why are things the way they are? Um, and our discoveries about form, basically, in the last few years, we've found that it's interesting to think, instead of thinking of authorship, designers and architects are always kind of inventing form in their minds. Uh, instead of doing it that way, allowing material and process to make form. It's kind of an interesting thing, like let go. Um, so in this slide you saw um, a crucible of molten copper, uh, which we used to kind of, uh, I'll use this to ex explain an idea, um, a piece that we made called 19. So usually form is, is kind of like predetermined, but in this case we invented a manufacturing system that allowed unique form to emerge in every iteration of the procedure. So here you see uh, the copper being poured into a sand cast mold. We intentionally left uh, the perimeter of the mold open such that the copper floods the cavity and uh, intentionally we pour way too much copper into the piece and it overflows in a completely unpredictable way. Um, I have to move out of the light because I can't see. But see, there it is. It's, it, as the, the liquid copper pours into the open perimeter of the mold and, and overflows. And it's kind of exciting because it means that every time you do this, you get a completely unique piece. Um, and uh, what, what, what I find interesting about that is that the copper oxidizes immediately when it touches air. So in this slide, you'll see the piece is being removed from... Oh, the video is kind of shaky, but... Um, the piece is removed from the sand and the sh sand is shaken off and you can see this kind of interesting halo around the circle um, which is unique in every piece and we intentionally polished the inside of the piece which you'll see in a minute, the circle um, and it forms a very, very sharp contrast to the uh, more volcanic oxidized halo that's around. Um, and so uh, I, I'm very proud of this piece because I think it's the purest iteration of this idea that we've come across because the only decision that we made, the only moment of authorship in this case, was to decide on the diameter of the circle. Every other uh, decision comes from the material itself. So here you see two pieces side by side and the halo is, is completely, this kind of oxidized volcanic halo is, com is completely unique in both cases. This is kind of like a piece that we made a very few of, um, but I'll, so, I'll also show how the same idea of relinquishing control um, works for a mass-produced scenario. Here's a, a blown glass piece called 28. And so here, the interesting thing is that people have been blowing glass for thousands of years, but in all that time, the focus has always been on taking a glass matrix and pushing air into it, which we've done here in this case to make this bubble. Um, but what we started experimenting with is what happens when you take air out. So what we do is we allow the piece to cool and then we locally heat a patch on the exterior of the piece. Um, so now imagine you have a, a cold glass sphere with a red hot patch. Um, and we only have about 70 seconds to do this in, otherwise the piece shatters and breaks. Um, and then what happens is we drop super hot glass into that patch. You'll see in a second. Okay, so we drop a, a super hot batch of different color of glass, in this case white, into the red hot patch and then we reverse the direction of airflow. So 
Um, and this is the innovative part because what happens is there's a vacuum that's created inside the first sphere that was created. Um, and the only glass that's able to react to that vacuum is the freshly melted glass. And so what essentially you get is, a, is an implosion, a totally unpredictable implosion inside the glass piece, which again results in completely unpredictable form. So again, we'll wait for the next slide, but I guess <laughs> what, what's exciting about it is that it's a, you know, people sort of think of these things as predetermined objects, but they're not. We never really set out to make a sphere or uh, a circle or any of these things. It's, it's, it's more like we experimented with a material and the material sort of told us what it wanted to do. There we go. Okay, so you see it being dropped, and that's the implosion I was speaking of earlier. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's really important to start thinking of form in this way because it's off. I think design and architecture are kind of stuck right now. Uh, there's this kind of superfluous exercise of form making, but nobody's actually finding form in a kind of sincere way. So, um, what we're hoping to do, you know, like there's incredible structural acrobatics that have to do with achieving a precise form that's based on an author's idea of what something should look like or should feel like. But what I'm ad advocating is a way of looking at design that allows the materials to tell us what their form should be like. So I, I, I've, I'm speaking about this piece for way longer than I planned. But <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you know, and I guess what I could say is that there's an interesting thing that in our, in our office is an interesting thing that happens, which is a kind of editorial process that comes afterwards. So we have this um, period of experimentation and usually yields a kind of uh, discovery. And then there's a whole uh, phase of editing and kind of curating. And so I, I showed you earlier the, the sort of alchemical discovery. And then here you see what happens to it. We, just, we sort of figure out very pragmatic ways of suspending it, of lighting it, of uh, installing it in a way that makes sense, that people can actually do, and the piece becomes a part of people's lives. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting, because in this case we added color, so that's another infinity of variables that we've added to, the, to this unpredictable system. Um, there, there's one more project that I'll speak about, and that's our first attempt to apply the same way of thinking to the scale of a building. Um, and in this case, it's a house, and it began with these beams, which are 100 years old, and they're reclaimed, and some of them are, have quite astonishing proportions, uh, between 30 and 50 feet long, between 2 and 3 feet deep, really interesting and beautiful uh, as artifacts. And so for this project, we decided not to cut a single one of them as a first sort of poetic decision. Um, but what it ended up meaning is that we had to work with all kinds of different lengths of beams, each with its own structural capacity. Um, and in, we had to invent a, a geometry that was able to make coherent domestic space using these different components. And so we basically tied them into a series of triangles, because a triangle is always a triangle, no matter how long or short each of the tangent, tangents are. And then we knit the triangles into a kind of fabric, um, which became the roof, an artificial landscape that we sort of draped over the natural landscape. And then we just bent and kinked it to make domestic space. And also we obliterated corners. So in this case, you see how those giant beams triangle roof sections terminate with no corner, and it makes a, an interesting, ambiguous, sort of partially inside, partially outside space, um, which we had to figure out how to do. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to talk in this slide about the way that we've detailed the project. We just put basically a, a giant window looking at a beam. So it's not a window where people look out or where light comes in, it's just kind of looking at this beam, chunk of wood, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is appropriate because that's the whole uh, generator for the project. And this is kind of the end of it. I, I, people often say, you, you really love triangles or, uh, you know, <laughs> I do, I love them, but I, I love hexagons too and, uh, <laughs> and s spheres and cylinders. But uh, the, the critical thing about this project is that the triangles just came from the material. Uh, uh, it's in White Rock. 
White Rock. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you.